Thank you. It's wonderful to be here today. As a museum educator, I always um, start my tours by asking my school groups, can everybody hear me? Can everybody see me? OK, please tell me if that's not true. Um, and I'm here to talk to you about the streets uh, of downtown Manhattan, right where we are. And we're at a really apt place on Broad Street. We're south of the wall. And we're going to talk about um, the eight minutes that it used to take to walk from the southern tip of uh, Manhattan, or what was then New Amsterdam, as I'm going to say, uh, to the northern border, um, eight minutes. And that's how long I have to speak with you. So it's good timing. And um, I'll start by saying, uh, museum education, we are people who encourage others to ask questions. And I encourage you to ask questions. And that will be um, the point of my talk, really, is that as you explore New York, go about your day to day, you're going to find clues to the history. And I want you to notice them. And then I want you to share them, whether you're standing on the street on your cell phone and you see something and then you want to share in a conversation, hey, did you notice this? What's that? Why is the street like this? Why the crazy names? The clues and the answers are all around you, and they're, they're begging to be considered. Um, so let's get started. Everybody knows this map. We use it every day. It's on the uh, subways. We see it. We use it. We don't normally see it in this direction. I had it this way on purpose um, because it helps you view things, I think, with a new perspective. Some things you might notice looking at the map this way is that there's a whole lot of blue. We are surrounded by water. In New York City, we are five boroughs, only one of which is actually connected to North America. I've heard people in the Bronx say they're the only real Americans, um, and everybody else is not, which makes me chuckle. So uh, these are water highways. And if we're thinking about this from a historic point of view, let me use the pointer here. OK, great. Um, so what's not really pictured is the Lower Bay and Staten Island, but you do see the Verrazano Bridge right there. And turning your time clocks way back to 1524, that's named for Giovanni de Verrazzano. Oh, pardon me, I'm much too far up. Giovanni de Verrazzano, who first explored this region um, for the Europeans, did not get up any of the rivers, did not get up the Hudson River, but essentially writes, this is great, we've got to come back and check it out. And it's not until 1609, uh, when our good friend Henry Hudson makes the first voyage um, in the Hudson River, of course, which is then named for him up there. It's first called the North River, and later the name is changed and there are tremendous resources from this voyage that are a lot of fun to read. If you um, are a reader, you might want to check out Gotham. It's the history of our city. It's the, the Bible for the history of New York, really. And there are some great descriptions, including uh, people on the crew saying that there were oysters as large as a man's wrist to his elbow. And I look at my wrist to my elbow, and I imagine an oyster that big. And I have, uh, well, I want to eat it, and uh, I want to see it. And you can find these shells. There are also a wealth of um, tangible objects, as well as the streets that are uh, clues and the waterways, which are named, that are clues. We have tangible objects, um, which I'll talk about later, is our archaeological history. They also, however, describe oysters that are six feet tall. Um, I'm sorry, lobsters that are six feet tall. So you can imagine me as the six-foot lobster if you want to. Um, and what I'll really be thinking about and talking with you about right here, whoops, pardon me, is this most southern point of Manhattan. And it's oriented facing the ocean. Uh, and it would be really the most protected area coming in from the lower bay to the upper bay here. You reach the southern tip of Manhattan. And oriented this way is how you'll see it in most of the historic maps, which I'll show you. OK, this is a copy of the Costello Plan. It's recreated in many different incarnations in museums in the city and around the world. You can Google it. Um, and I know we're all wired, and I'm really going to encourage you also to go back and Google some of the things I tell you about or to look them up on the search engine of your choice. Uh, but the Costello map is currently in Florence, and it shows something you may recognize. It shows the southern tip of Manhattan here. Um, we have a border. We have, this is the East River, and we have the Hudson River. Some things are missing, um, and that's something to keep in mind also. And I've actually, in teaching, often encouraged student groups to make their own maps, maybe of their neighborhood, of something that they know well. And you'd be amazed, but you may have a hard time putting on the map. You think you know a place until you go to draw it. You think you know a story until you go to tell it also, I suppose. Um, but what is left off of a map can sometimes be um, an important detail. It can be an omission. So we'll talk about what's not on this map. Um, and I'll also say, to take a step back and tell a, a personal story here, I am not a native New Yorker. I would love to claim that I am. Um, but I moved around a little bit when I was younger, worked in museums uh, in Virginia, teaching colonial history, and then moved up here after graduating college to teach in New York City museums. How incredibly exciting, how wonderful, dream job. Um, but I was teaching New York City history, so I had to learn it. And at the Museum of the City of New York, 
they teach a, a fabulous program for school groups that's all about the creation of the New York City grid. So I'm going to go back one. And many of you probably use the grid every single day. And I should also say happy birthday to the New York City grid because this is the 200th anniversary of its creation. It was created in 1811 by DeWitt Clinton. And it helps us with these uh, 12 avenues going north-south and originally 155 streets. Um, I'm sorry, uh, 155 streets east-west there. And uh, there's a great quote from DeWitt Clinton. He says, it is impossible that for generations to come, people will ever live above the Harlem Flats. And I love thinking that they planned for more than they ever thought they would use. And here's our big city now, 9 million people strong and growing every single day. Um, so we taught about the grid. And I, I did this activity that I thought was perfect with school groups. And I would have us seated in a, in a U around a map of the grid. And I would say, OK, let's all go around and tell me your names. And they would go around with their names, you know, Kate, Matthew, Gabriella. OK, go all the way around, David, Joseph. Um, and then I would go around and try to repeat their names. Could I do it? No. I couldn't remember it. They had no meaning to me. And my point was that downtown, the streets of Manhattan were a mush and a muddle. And they have these street names that you can't remember. And so DeWitt Clinton was attempting to solve a problem by giving, instead of names, numbers, something that have a very logical order. And I was so proud of myself for coming up with this teaching technique. Great. So then we'd go around, give me a number, one, two, three, four, five. It's very logical. Um, and then after leaving Museum of the City of New York to go down to the Seaport Museum, I found myself right in the middle of this muddle of streets and tasked uh, with the job of teaching about these streets that I had been um, busting for having no order whatsoever, and I had to learn them. But what I learned was that they have a very um, beautiful and organic logic. They're named for what they used to be or what they used to do, and it's, it's a great thing to see. So I'm just going to show you here the Costello plan. We have the natural shoreline of Manhattan here, which some of you may know is not the shoreline um, that we see today. This is Pearl Street. And it gets its name from those oyster shells that were as large as a man's wrist to his elbow. That's the natural shoreline. And built out what we have today as Water Street, Front Street, and South Street. That's on 17th century trash. Um, and it's great to then also walk and find this northern, northern border here where the wall used to be, which I'm sure people can guess is Wall Street. Um, and you can find other streets with names that tell you their stories. And I really do want to encourage you to go out and look around you. Why is it called, well, Broad Street? So Broad Street on our map is right down here. And uh, you'll see it's not a street. It's actually a waterway. Uh, it was a canal used by the Dutch in New Amsterdam to bring goods up into the center of the city to help to build it. And then it was filled in with trash, got awfully smelly, uh, was a street. And because it was broader than the others, it was logically named Broad Street. We also have Broadway here, which predates the colony. Um, it goes back to um, pre-European contact at the Lenape Trail, um, or as one of my students once said, the Monopolies, which makes me laugh instead of the Lenape. And it's true, they had a monopoly on Manhattan. Um, let's go forward here. I'll show you. It's a little bit dark in this slide, but this is a painting that's owned by the Seaport Museum. And it's uh, New Amsterdam 1660, you can see here, based on authentic Dutch records. Uh, so we know that the painter is not there painting what he sees, but he's done his homework. And it's an animation of the map you saw before. And here you can see Broad Street as this waterway. You can also just barely make out Stone Street. It used to be called Brewer's Street for all the taverns. And then it was the first paved street. So its name is logically now Stone Street. And then you can see an open green area there next to Fort Amsterdam that's Bowling Green. So let's go see what some of these places look like today. So you can wink at them as you pass. This is the subway station at Wall Street on the 4 or 5. Wonder if anybody's noticed that stepped gable Dutch roof and then this wooden wall here at Wall Street, the fortification. Um, obviously, the subways are not contemporaries of the wall at Wall Street, uh, but it's a good reminder. So look for these reminders. You can wink at it. Oh, this is one that I like. So this was very close by. It's on Beaver Street. And you'll see our beavers here. And uh, a former colleague of mine, when teaching school groups, once I observed her, it's a great thing for people to do, uh, to observe your coworkers and learn from them. And she was giving this fabulous program. Uh, but she said to the students, OK, and Henry Hudson's crew looked up, and all around in the trees, they saw beavers. And I thought, 
she's never seen beavers in real life. They don't, they don't climb trees at all. But the joke's on me because uh, in, in this uh, over the doorway on Beaver Street, you can see beavers. So they're, they're sort of up in the trees. So look for them. It's just around the corner from here. Um, at 85 Broad Street, you can stand on a, a version of the Costello Plan. And it's just around the corner from a place where you can look at original foundations and the sandy bottom of what I said was the original shoreline of Pearl Street. You can see the foundations of the Stethoist, the original Dutch State House, um, and Lovelace's Tavern. And I also encourage you to follow this through the building at 85 Broad Street because they've built over the original street of Stone Street and uh, you have the right to walk through it. So I encourage you to use that right. And then you can en end down here at Bowling Green where you have free Wi-Fi. Bowling Green is the first public park in New York City and um, jumping ahead in history from Dutch New Amsterdam to revolutionary New York, you can see these spots right here that are jagged. They used to have uh, the British crown on them. And during a rally, just after the uh, Declaration of Independence was read, an inflamed mob walked down to Bowling Green to tear down um, a statue of the king that used to be where the fountain is now. Only it was incredibly heavy and they had a hard time doing it. So as they were waiting and chanting, uh, they picked off all of the crowns there. So this is an 18th century um, metal gate that you can still go and see. And you can lean on it and you can chant. Um, so I hope that you notice things around you. Uh, there are plaques everywhere. There are street names. There are tremendous resources at your fingertips at New York City Museums, New York Historical Society, Museum of the City of New York, Seaport Museum, Tenement Museum. So make use of them. Sign on to your wireless blog about them and um, share what you know with me. Thanks very much. Mm -hmm.